Here we are, the season four finale. This one episode has like three things that have been carefully built up for a while. Some more than most, but all important for the respective characters. This episode is a very direct in its pacing. I and mean, we've got all the setup already, well, set up. So they immediately get us going and I appreciate they don't try and faff about for a few minutes. The Catch vs. Hordak fight is as normal as it is for Catcher who mostly jumps around and dodges this guy's beam of death. And though she can find a way to get the drop on him, that's kind of typical to how she fights people stronger than her. Was kind of disappointed that she won without getting at least a few scratches. Now I cannot talk about this finale without focusing a lot of time on Catra's most important scene. The one that kicks off the path she takes in season 5. Hey Catra. No. You can't do this. You can't come in and take this from me now. I've definitely noticed that within the fanbase there's this idea. You really are obsessed, aren't you? Kitten. The double trouble is trying to gaslight Catra in this scene, and I couldn't disagree more. You know, it took me a while, but I finally figured out your character. Catra has been fixated on this revenge path since like season 3, having started it back in season 1 ep 11 when she deems Adora has broken her promises, always having her back no matter what. You try so hard to play the big bad villain, but your heart's never been in it, has it? Catra's wrath at first stems from feelings of betrayal, and well yes, Catra did bottle up a lot of her feelings in a way that Adora couldn't have known what was going on. To be honest, Adora herself needed to have been a bit deaf and blind not to notice what was going on at times. Duh! Did you just figure that out? She's been messing with our heads since we were kids. You never protected me! Not in any way that would put you on Shadow Weaver's bad side! That being said, this whole antagonist to Adora's hero thing really wasn't something she was truly passionate about. It was more an impulsive reaction of anger towards Adora. In season 3, she was honestly considering just staying in the Crimson Ways. This is the happiest I've ever seen you! Scratch that. This is the first time I've ever seen you happy, period. Because as Scorpia identified right there, Catra actually hated being with the Horde. It sucked. She wasn't getting what she wanted to out of being Force Captain, Nobody really cared about her but Scorpia and maybe Entrapta, with any power she had being a paper dragon at best. People have hurt you, haven't they? But instead of staying in the waste and choosing to try and be happy, she lets her rage at Shadow Weaver leaving her and her abandonment issues with Adora swell up again and heads right back to the fight zone to either win the war or blow up the world. Katra wouldn't be in a clear state of mind for the longest time after that, and never really considered the worthiness of this cause to herself. So yeah, DT is right. Katra's heart has never truly been in this 100%. They didn't believe in you. They didn't trust you. Didn't need you. Deep down, Katra wasn't into this, and deluded herself into thinking revenge was the only way to get what she's always wanted. But has it ever been fully defined? The two of us are going to be ruling Etheria together, just like we always plan. Is that what you really want? To rule the world? I mean, yeah, obviously. Isn't that what you want too? No. Hell, whenever she speaks about winning the war, it's always in this like crazed manner. If I can pull this off, everything, everything will have been worth it. Like she's trying to convince herself that's true. Catra herself admitted that the conquest of Etheria was feeling hollow, and when Scorpia left, sorry, when Catra drove Scorpia away, she even tried attempting at reconnecting with her old squad. I think deep down what Catra really wants is to belong somewhere, to feel loved and appreciated by people, but only recently tried to pursue it because she's been so fixated on this getting back against those that have wronged her. But did you ever stop to think, maybe they're not the problem? And by the time she realized that this end goal was actually pretty hollow when you think about it... It's you. You drive them away, Wildcat. She had already ruined all her chances of genuinely being happy. She has to keep going with this Conqueror Etheria plan because if she leaves it, Catra is left with nothing. She will become nothing, loved or respected or feel by nobody. And I do believe this is DT giving her a kick in the sensibilities, not because they care or anything, more because they enjoy overanalyzing people for their shape-shifting, and wanted to tear Catra down with the hard truth that her pain and suffering cannot be fixed with revenge, and she's been self-sabotaging any attempts to actually 
be happy and improve her life. Because it's a delicious twist that screws with her. I mean, look at the way Double Toe revealed there were a double agent and got her whole army wiped out. Your face right now is almost better than applause. Talking about how Glinga's got some super weapon to win the war and Capture is basically screwed. And she just sits there as DT leaves. She could have run, but so what? Where was she supposed to run to? Scorpia's gone. She basically killed and trapped us. She blew any chance with her old squad. Adora hates her. Shadow Weaver never cared. Wardog wants to kill her now, and hell, the rest of Etheria would probably want her head on a pike. She has nothing. She is nothing now. Catra doesn't rage. She doesn't cry. This is the end, and she is going to meet it quietly. <laughs> And that end happens to be Glimmer. Now let's talk about Glimmer. By now, we all know her motivation and drive. And also know it's a sort of drive that's barreling her towards the cliff's edge. The show doesn't make that part too big a thing because, I mean, we all know what's coming. Scorpia gets some neat lightning powers after connecting with the Black Garden. Like, dang. I know they're all souped up because of the heart of Etheria is now powering up, but that's still neat. Glim comes into this and is quite thrown by what she's seeing. She was probably expecting some kind of climactic duel by the end of it all. And at first she's all tough and powered up, mentioning how Catcher's defeated, her armies are gone, she's all alone. What are you waiting for? Do it. Yeah, Catcher's beaten, lost the war, and here's Glimmer, by herself, with one of her friends achieving victory. Looks like we're both alone. Sparkles. Hey, wait a second. Is, are they trying to create some sort of weird parallel between these two characters for some reason? Oh, shoot up. Oh, right. <laughs> a theory of being a planet-sized bomb that Glimmer just primed a blow. How can I forget about that? Adora was right. My hope. Used me. The heart of Etheria will be unleashed against the first one's enemies. As I've said before, it's not that Light Hope is evil, it's more she's just a computer program following her instructions. And you can say that throughout these scenes. Why I used all my strength to reach across the entire universe to find you and bring you here. She is a cog in a machine who stole a door away to replace another gear that broke itself off. Which is the story of Adora's life. The whole thing is marked by being used by others to achieve something. The first choice she thought she made was leaving the Horde and accepting the power of She-Ra, but that too was painted as more something Light Hope was sitting around waiting to happen. This is your intended function. It is what you were born to do. It was her destiny to find that sword and her destiny to be the trigger for this bomb. She left her predetermined fate in the Horde to join some other predetermined fate the moment she touched the sword. No, I won't! The heart of Etheria has been activated. There is no stopping it now. Uh. Light up had this whole destiny thing planned out. And actually got a door to follow along, and despite her best efforts to resist, it's happening anyway. Even without her direct aid, it really looks like some sort of predetermined outcome taking place. Mara hit us into Spongeo so you couldn't hurt anyone else. That also means nothing as Light Hope is a balanced planet to literally just teleport Etheria away. Mara. Mara's interference caused a significant delay. Pleading with Light Hope works, but just a little bit. Mara. Mara would not want me to. Mara was a traitor. Desperately trying to keep that sword pinned down doesn't, as Light Hope tries to just lift it anyway. This whole thing feels like a brief fight between the cold logic of Light Hope's programming and a deep sense of resistance by Adora to finally just get out of this whole predetermined destiny nonsense. Don't do it. She is fighting to actually make a damn choice and almost loses it, but. Watching that blade fall and shattered filled me with such a sense of relief and satisfaction in Adora that I am barely able to describe it. She did it. Uh, Adora actually did it. She broke free from all this. She's able to make a real conscious free choice and the Light Hope is right there to thank her for it. Even though this will have a bit of a consequence later on. Oh, but we're not done yet. Now this episode still isn't over. There was like six minutes left. 
I'm only just narrowly avoided the planet's destruction. Oh boy, something bad happens as freaking Horde Primes arrives and wow. Horde Prime was just a little bit built up as a character, but I don't think they needed that as these last few minutes this season sends enough in my book as Hordak and Glimmer just gets teleported right up to his ship and the guy gets to reunite with his quote unquote brother and it's absolutely not the gracious moment Hordak was expecting. I thought you had perished. Prime starts off like cool and calm and he tries to understand just what the heck is even going on. Why can I not see your thoughts? Last time he saw Horak, he sent him off to die, if you recall. You have given yourself a name. You tried to create an empire of your own. There was even a time you wished I would not come for you. And then he just snaps into a fury at the insinuation that Horak could be anything like his equal or possibly deserve to be at his side. Fury born. And simply just tosses him to his minions to be reconditioned. We only get minutes of Horde Prime, and I'm already wary of him, and not because of the fleet of ships he's got. He talks of wanting nothing but peace. Then you'll leave us alone. Oh no, child. But come on, who didn't know exactly what kind of peace this guy was talking about? This whole mess must be wiped away, beginning with you. And the casual way he speaks about removing his brother's embarrassment, bumping into Etheria, the place we as the audience have been getting to know, exploring this world with the characters and getting to know people on it, it, it means nothing to this guy. It's just another planet and he'll destroy it without a second thought. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Except, as it happens, Catra is also there and senses a sort of opportunity. The whole planet is some kind of ancient super weapon. Sparkles here is a part of it. So Etheria is going to be conquered rather than destroyed? Yay! And if you want to learn how to use it, you need me. Catra, on the other hand, well, she's kind of lost everything on Etheria, but hell, maybe this could give her a new start? At least that's what I think is going on with Catra here. She sees this chance to become something more once more and just grasps it instinctively. And the whole season ends with this we won one more, but here is the next one right here, and nobody is prepared for it. So, how did this season measure up? Well, it's certainly got a lot of moments I would call unnecessary, and therefore filler. I definitely enjoyed Double Trouble and the Spinnerel and Atasa moment, and feel a lot less enthusiastic about King Micah being here, but other than that, the drama between characters and the descent of Catra finally reaching its peak was good to watch, and that ending. I was so binging the fifth season right after that. So that was season four finale over analyzing share. If you like this video and want to see more, hit that thumbs up and the subscribe button and bell to get notifications about the next episode. I try to update the series every Thursday, so please try and share with other fans. And also check out my channel for my video essays, music analysis, and complex character series. You might find them enjoyable as well.